To better understand the current state of modern-day media manipulation, we must first look at the father of propaganda, Edward Bernays. His influence on the 20th century rivaled that of his uncles, Sigmund Freud, as Bernays pioneered the idea of crowd psychology with Freud's psychoanalytical ideas in what would become a new political ideal on how to control the masses. In his 1928 book, Propaganda, Bernays wrote, If we understand the mechanisms and motives of the group mind, it is now possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without them knowing it. He called it the engineering of consent and proposed that those, those who, who manipulate, manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. It was Bernays who introduced the corporate giants to crowd psychology methods and polished techniques to manipulate society. He convinced the population to buy on impulse things they didn't even need by linking mass-produced goods to their own unconscious desires. The tobacco industry hired Bernays to persuade women to take up smoking, and the Alcoa Aluminum Company asked him to drive the campaign for the national fluoridation of our water supply. A consumerist culture was born, and the U.S. government took notice. In addition to famous corporate giants, Bernays also began working for the federal government. They adopted his technique of manufacturing ever-present dangers and then maintaining a constant state of fear to give those in power greater control of what Bernays called the mass mind. Edward Bernays, who's the father of modern advertising and propaganda, he literally wrote the book, Propaganda. Joseph Goebbels, on record, the Nazi propaganda minister, used a lot of his information and, and, and twisted it to his own designs. Bernays was the chief psychological warfare expert for more than 20 years, advising the Department of War. He, he advised them to call it defense, don't be honest anymore. Call it the Department of Defense, because you're actually going to run giant imperial slaughter operations. But the heart of the story is not just Sigmund Freud, but other members of the Freud family. When this episode is about Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays. Bernays is almost completely unknown today, but his influence on the 20th century was nearly as great as his uncle's. Because Bernays was the first person to take Freud's ideas about human beings and use them to manipulate the masses. He showed American corporations for the first time how they could make people want things they didn't need by linking mass-produced goods to their unconscious desires. Out of this would come a new political idea of how to control the masses. By satisfying people's inner selfish desires, one made them happy and thus docile. At that time, Freud's young nephew, Edward Bernays, was working as a press agent in America. His main client was the world-famous opera singer, Caruso, who was touring the United States. Bernays' parents had emigrated to America 20 years before, but he kept in touch with his uncle and joined him for holidays in the Alps. But Bernays was now about to return to Europe for a very different reason. On the night that Caruso opened in Toledo, Ohio, America announced it was entering the war against Germany and Austria. As a part of the war effort, the US government set up a committee on public information and Bernays was employed to promote America's war aims in the press. 
president, Woodrow Wilson, had announced that the United States would fight not to restore the old empires, but to bring democracy to all of Europe. Bernays proved extremely skillful in promoting this idea, both at home and abroad. And at the end of the war, he was asked to accompany the president to the Paris Peace Conference. Then, to my surprise, they asked me to go over with, with Woodrow Wilson to the Peace Conference. And at the age of 1926, I was in Paris for the entire time of the Peace Conference that was held in the suburb of Paris, and we worked to make the world safe for democracy. That was a big slogan. Wilson's reception in Paris astounded Bernays and the other American propagandists. Their propaganda had portrayed Wilson as a liberator of the people, a man who would create a new world in which the individual would be free. They had made him a hero of the masses. And as he watched the crowd surge around Wilson, Bernays began to wonder whether it would be possible to do the same type of mass persuasion, but in peacetime. When I came back to the United States, I decided that if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. And propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So what I did was to try to find some other words. So we found the word Council on Public Relations. Bernays returned to New York and set up as a public relations council in a small office off Broadway. It was the first time the term had ever been used. Since the end of the 19th century, America had become a mass industrial society with millions clustered together in the cities. Bernays was determined to find a way to manage and alter the way these new crowds thought and felt. To do this, he turned to the writings of his uncle Sigmund. While in Paris, Bernays had sent his uncle a gift of some Havana cigars. In return, Freud had sent him a copy of his general introduction to psychoanalysis. Bernays read it, and the picture of hidden irrational forces inside human beings fascinated him. He wondered whether he might make money by manipulating the unconscious. What Eddie got from Freud was indeed this idea that there is a lot more going on in human decision making, not only among individuals, but even more importantly among groups, than this idea that information drives behavior. And so Eddie began to formulate this idea that you had to look at things that would play to people's irrational emotions. And you see, that moved Eddie immediately into a different category from other people in his field and most government officials and managers of the day who thought if you just hit people with all this factual information, they would look at that and say, oh, of course. And Eddie knew that was not the way the world worked. Bernays set out to experiment with the minds of the popular classes. His most dramatic experiment was to persuade women to smoke. At that time, there was a taboo against women smoking, and one of his early clients, George Hill, the president of the American Tobacco Corporation, asked Bernays to find a way of breaking it. He said, we're losing half of our market because men have invoked the taboo against women smoking in public. Can you do anything about that? I said, let me think about it. And then I said, have I your permission to see a psychoanalyst to find out what cigarettes mean to women? He said, what'll it cost? So I called up Dr. Brill a. A. Brill, who was a leading psychoanalyst in New York at that time. How come you didn't call your uncle? Why didn't you call your uncle? Because he was in Vienna. A. A. Brill was one of the first psychoanalysts in America. And for a large fee, he told Bernays that cigarettes were a symbol of the penis and of male sexual power. 
He told Bernays that if he could find a way to connect cigarettes with the idea of challenging male power, then women would smoke, because then they would have their own penises. Every year, New York held an Easter Day parade to which thousands came. And Bernays decided to stage an event there. He persuaded a group of rich debutantes to hide cigarettes under their clothes. Then, they should join the parade, and at a given signal from him, they were to light up the cigarettes dramatically. Bernays then informed the press that he had heard that a group of suffragettes were preparing to protest by lighting up what they called torches of freedom. He knew this would be an outcry, and he knew that all of the photographers would be there to capture this moment. And so he was ready with a phrase which was torches of freedom. And so here you have a symbol, women, young women, debutantes, smoking a cigarette in public with a phrase that means anybody who believes in this kind of equality pretty much has to support them in the ensuing debate about this, because torches of freedom. I mean, what's on all American coins? It's liberty. She's holding up the torch, you see? And so all of this is there together. There's emotion, there's memory, there's a rational phrase, even though it's using a lot of emotional elements, it's a, it's a phrase that works in a rational sense. Uh, all of this is together. And so the next day, this was not just in all of the New York papers, it was across the United States and around the world. And from that point forward, uh, the sale of cigarettes to women began to rise. He had made them socially acceptable with a single symbolic act. What Bernays had created was the idea that if a woman smoked, it made her more powerful and independent. An idea that still persists today. Embrace me, my sweet embrace. It made him realize that it was possible to persuade people to behave irrationally if you link products to their emotional desires and feelings. The idea that smoking actually made women freer was completely irrational, but it made them feel more independent. It meant that irrelevant objects could become powerful emotional symbols of how you wanted to be seen by others. Eddie Bernays saw the way to sell product was not to sell it to your intellect, that you ought to buy an automobile, but that you will feel better about it if you have this automobile. I think he originated that idea, that they weren't just purchasing something, but they were engaging themselves, emotionally or personally, in, in, in the product or service. That it's not, you, you think you need a new piece of clothing, but you'll feel better with the piece of clothing. That was his contribution in a very real sense. We see it all over the place today, but I think he originated the idea of the emotional connect to a product or service. What Bernays was doing fascinated America's corporations. They had come out of the war rich and powerful, but they had a growing worry. The system of mass production had flourished during the war, and now millions of goods were pouring off production lines. What they were frightened of was the danger of overproduction, that there would come a point when people had enough goods and would simply stop buying. Up until that point, the majority of products were still sold to the masses on the basis of need. While the rich had long been used to luxury goods, for the millions of working class Americans, most products were still advertised as necessities. Goods like shoes, stockings, even cars were promoted in functional terms for their durability. The aim of the advertisements was simply to show people the product's practical virtues, nothing more. What the corporations realized they had to do was transform the way the majority of Americans thought about products. One leading Wall Street banker, Paul Mazur of Lehman Brothers, was clear about what was necessary. We must shift America, he wrote, from a needs to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire, to want new things even before the old had been entirely consumed. 
we must shape a new mentality in America. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. Prior to that time, there was no American consumer. There was the American worker, and there was the American owner, and they manufactured, and they saved, and they ate what they had to, and the people shopped for what they needed. And while the very rich may have bought things they didn't need, most people did not. And Mazur envisioned the break with that, where you would have things that you didn't actually need, but you wanted, as opposed to needed. And the man who would be at the center of changing that mentality for the corporations was Edward Bernays. Bernays really is the guy within the United States, more than anybody else, who sort of brings to the table psychological theory as something that is an essential part of how, from the corporate side, of how we are going to appeal to the masses effectively and the whole sort of merchandising establishment and sales and sales establishment is ready for Sigmund Freud I mean they are ready for understanding what motivates the human mind and so that there's this real openness to Bernays's techniques being used to sell products to the masses beginning in the early 20s the New York banks funded the creation of chains of department stores across America they were to be the outlets for the mass-produced goods, and Bernays's job was to produce the new type of customer. Bernays began to create many of the techniques of mass consumer persuasion that we now live with. He was employed by William Randolph Hearst to promote his new women's magazines, and Bernays glamorized them by placing articles and advertisements that linked products made by others of his clients to famous film stars like Clara Bow, who was also his client. Bernays also began the practice of product placement in the movies. And he dressed the stars at the film's premieres with clothes and jewellery from other firms he represented. He was, he claimed, the first person to tell car companies they could sell cars as symbols of male sexuality. He employed psychologists to issue reports that said products were good for you and then pretended they were independent studies. He organised fashion shows in the department stores and paid celebrities to repeat the new and essential message. You bought things not just for need, but to express your inner sense of yourself to others. There's a psychology of dress. Have you ever thought about it? How it can express your character? You all have interest. There's a psychology of dress. Have you ever thought about it? How it can express your character? You all have interesting characters, but some of them are all hidden. I wonder why you all want to dress always the same, with the same hats and the same coats. I'm sure all of you are interesting and have wonderful things about you, but looking at you in the street, you all look so much the same. And that's why I'm talking to you about the psychology of dress. Try and express yourselves better in your dress. certain things that you think are hidden. I wonder if you've thought of this angle of your personality. I'd like to ask you some questions. Oh. Why do you like short skirts? Oh, because there's more to see. <laughs> more to see, eh? What, uh, what good does that do you? <laughs> it makes you more attractive. It does? In 1927, an American journalist wrote, a change has come over our democracy. It is called consumptionism. The American citizen's first importance to his country is now no longer that of citizen, but that of consumer. The growing wave of consumerism helped in turn to create a stock market boom. And yet again, Edward Bernays became involved, promoting the novel idea that ordinary people should buy shares borrowing money from banks he also represented. And yet again, millions followed his advice. He was uniquely knowledgeable about how people in large numbers are going to react to products and ideas and so on. But in, term, in political terms, if he were to go out, so I can't imagine that he could get three people to stand and listen. Wasn't particularly articulate, was a 
kind of funny looking and didn't have any sense of reaching out for people one on one. None at all. He didn't talk about, didn't think about people in groups of one, thought about people in groups of thousands. So I would have nothing to do with him. Hello? Bernays soon became famous as the man who understood the mind of the crowd. And in 1924, the president contacted him. President Coolidge was a quiet, taciturn man and had become a national joke. The press portrayed him as a dull, humorless figure. Bernays' solution was to do exactly the same as he had done with products. He persuaded 34 famous film stars to visit the White House. And for the first time, politics became involved with public relations. And I lined up these 34 people and I'd say, what's your name? He'd say, Al Jolson. I'd say, Mr. President, Al Jolson. Next day, every newspaper in the United States had a front page story. President Coolidge entertains actors at White House. And the Times had a headline which said, President nearly laughed. And everybody was happy. But while Bernays became rich and powerful in America, in Vienna, his uncle was facing disaster. Like much of Europe, Vienna was suffering an economic crisis and massive inflation, which wiped out all of Freud's savings. Facing bankruptcy, he wrote to his nephew for help. Bernays responded by arranging for Freud's works to be published for the first time in America, and began to send his uncle precious dollars, which Freud kept secretly in a foreign bank account. He was Freud's agent, if you will, to get his books published. Well, of course, once the books were being published, Eddie couldn't help himself but to promote these books, see that everybody read them, make them controversial, emphasize the fact that, do you know what Freud says about sex and what he says cigarettes are a symbol of and so on and so forth? How do you suppose all those stories got out? Certainly the academics weren't spreading these around the country. Eddie Bernays was. Then... When Freud became accepted, well then, of course, to go to, to a client and say, well, Uncle Siggy, see, then that had some cachet. But notice there, first Eddie created Uncle Siggy in the U.S., made him acceptable, secondly, and thirdly, then capitalized on Uncle Siggy. Typical Bernays performance. Bernays also suggested that Freud promote himself in the United States. He proposed his uncle write an article for Cosmopolitan, a magazine that Bernays represented, entitled A Woman's Mental Place in the Home. Freud was furious. Such an idea, he said, was unthinkable. It was vulgar, and anyway, he hated America. The publication of Freud's works in America had an extraordinary effect on journalists and intellectuals in the 1920s. What fascinated and frightened them was the picture Freud painted of submerged, dangerous forces lurking just under the surface of modern society. Forces that could erupt easily to produce the frenzied mob which had the power to destroy even governments. It was this they believed had happened in Russia. To many, this meant that one of the guiding principles of mass democracy was wrong. The belief that human beings could be trusted to make decisions on a rational basis. The leading political writer, Walter Lippmann, argued that if human beings were in reality driven by unconscious, irrational forces, then it was necessary to rethink democracy. What was needed was a new elite who could manage what he called the bewildered herd. This would be done through psychological techniques that would control the unconscious feelings of the masses. So here you have Walter Lippmann, probably the most influential political thinker in the United States, who is essentially saying that the basic mechanism of the mass mind is unreason, is irrationality, is animality. He believes that the mob in the street, which is how he sees ordinary people, are people who are driven not by their minds but by their spinal cords. The notion of kind of animal drives, 
unconscious instinctual drives lurking beneath the surface of civilization. And so they started looking towards psychological science as a way of understanding the mechanisms by which the popular mind works, specifically with the goal of figuring out how to understand how to apply those mechanisms to strategies for uh, social control. Edward Bernays was fascinated by Lippmann's arguments and also saw a way to promote himself by using them. In the 1920s, he began to write a series of books which argued that he had developed the very techniques Lippmann was calling for. By stimulating people's inner desires and then sating them with consumer products, he was creating a new way to manage the irrational force of the masses. He called it the engineering of consent. Democracy, to my father, was a wonderful concept. But I don't think he felt that all those publics out there would m had reliable judgment, uh, and that 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 they could that they very easily might vote for the wrong man or want the wrong thing, so that they had to be guided from above. Uh, it's uh, enlightened despotism in a sense. You appeal to their desires and their unrecognized longings, that sort of thing that you can tap into their deepest desires or their deepest fears and use that to your own purposes. And then, in 1928, a president came to power who agreed with Bernays. President Hoover was the first politician to articulate the idea that consumerism had become the central motor of American life. After his election, he told a group of advertisers and public relations men you have taken over the job of creating desire and have transformed people into constantly moving happiness machines. Machines which have become the key to economic progress. What was beginning to emerge in the 1920s was a new idea of how to run mass democracy. At its heart was the consuming self, which not only made the economy work, but was happy and docile and so created a stable society. Both Bernays and Littmann's concept of managing the masses takes the idea of democracy and it turns it into a palliative. It turns it into uh, giving people some kind of feel-good med medication that will respond to an immediate pain or an immediate yearning but will not alter the objective circumstances one iota. I mean, democracy really, the idea of democracy at its heart was about changing the relations of power that had governed the world for so long. And Bernays' concept of democracy was one of maintaining the relations of power, even if it meant that one needed to sort of stimulate the psychological lives of the public. And in fact, in his mind, that was what was necessary. That if you can keep stimulating the irrational self, then leadership can basically go on doing what it wants to do. Bernays now became one of the central figures in a business elite that dominated American society and politics in the 1920s. He also became extremely rich and lived in a suite of rooms in one of New York's most expensive hotels, where he gave frequent parties. Oh my goodness, he had a home in the corner suite of the Sherry Netherland Hotel. And here's this wonderful suite with all these windows looking out on Central Park and across at the plaza and on the square. And he would use this place to hold a soiree. The mayor would come, all the media leaders would come, the political leaders, the business leaders, the people in the arts. I mean, it was a who's who. People wanted to know Eddie Bernays because, you know, he himself became a, a sort of a famous man, a sort of a magician who could make these things happen. He knows everybody. He knows the mayor and he knows the senator and he calls politicians on the telephone as if he did get a, 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 literally a, a high or a bang out of doing what he did. And that's fine, but it, it can be a little hard on the people around you especially when you make other people feel stupid. People who worked for him were stupid, and children were stupid, and 
if people did things in a way that he didn't, that he wouldn't have done them, they were stupid. It was, it was a word that he used over and over and over, dope and stupid. And the masses? They were stupid. But Bernays' power was about to be destroyed dramatically, and by a type of human irrationality, he could do nothing to control. At the end of October 1929, Bernays organized a huge national event to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the invention of the light bulb. President Hoover, the leaders of major corporations, and bankers like John D. Rockefeller were all summoned by Bernays to celebrate the power of American business. But even as they gathered, News came through that shares on the New York Stock Exchange were beginning to fall catastrophically. Throughout the 1920s, speculators had borrowed billions of dollars. The banks had promoted the idea that this was a new era, where market crashes were a thing of the past. But they were wrong. What was about to happen was the biggest stock market crash in history. Investors had panicked and begun to sell in a blind, relentless fury that no reassurance by bankers or politicians could halt. And on the 29th of October, 1929, the market collapsed. The effect of the crash on the American economy was disastrous. Faced with recession and unemployment, millions of American workers stopped buying goods they didn't need. The consumer boom that Bernays had done so much to engineer disappeared, and he, in the profession of public relations, fell from favor. Bernays's brief moment of power seemed to be over. 